Systemic inflammatory markers in the history can help distinguish between inflammatory and non-inflammatory conditions, such as pneumonia and congestive heart failure. The presence of fevers, chills, rigors would suggest inflammatory processes. However, consider a patient that presents with acute onset of shortness of breath and is found to have low blood pressure. She has a history of CHF, but also risk factors for pneumonia like underlying COPD. Her low blood pressure could be due to poor cardiac output from CHF, but also sepsis from pneumonia. The clinical dilemma is the following. Does she have pneumonia that would require antibiotics? Or does she need diuresis for management of volume overload? Inflammatory markers can help distinguish the two, but unfortunately, the patient doesn't always present with this specific history, or they may not initially present with a fever. Thus, this makes a diagnosis more difficult. Adding basic lab work may show leukocytosis and other inflammatory markers of infection that is useful. But lack of these doesn't rule out infection. This is crucial when we know that early antibiotic therapy is important for lowering mortality in the setting of pneumonia with sepsis. Traditional workup for this would also include plain chest x-ray. This is far from definitive most of the time. Radiographic changes for CHF and pneumonia are often very similar, which is not reassuring when management decisions are so divergent. Of course, one option is to treat for all considerations simultaneously, but this poses other problems. This strategy could lead to an overuse of antibiotics and the development of antibiotic resistance. Moreover, the management of volume status is truly completely opposite and mutually exclusive. Diuresis for volume overload versus early aggressive fluid resuscitation for pneumonia and sepsis. To help aid with our diagnosis, I suggest the use of procalcitonin. It's a protein produced at very low levels by the thyroid for the regulation of calcium. In response to severe systemic inflammation, procalcitonin levels rise dramatically. There is also additional production of procalcitonin in other tissues like the liver. Procalcitonin levels, therefore, are a wonderful inflammatory marker to help distinguish between these two divergent clinical considerations. Elevated levels are more suggestive of sepsis, pneumonia, and COPD exacerbations. It is proven to be a useful marker of infections in several other settings as well. It is important to note, procalcitonin is still elevated in infected patients with neutropenia, where most other inflammatory markers like fever, chills, leukocytosis are often lacking. Procalcitonin is also helpful in postoperative fevers. Fevers are a common occurrence postoperatively with a wide range of etiologies, such as deep vein thrombosis, atelectasis, and wound infection. Procalcitonin tends to be elevated in infections and not DVT or atelectasis. Time is of the essence in the presentation of a critically ill patient with shortness of breath. One of the diagnostic considerations is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Distinguishing this condition from sepsis or other causes of acute respiratory distress syndrome is crucial as the management is quite different. The use of inflammatory markers in history and physical exam certainly can help. But routine blood work like CBC, ESR, and CRP are usually not enough to distinguish between all the inflammatory conditions leading to critical illness. Radiology, likewise, is sometimes helpful but often not specific enough to distinguish between different autoimmune syndromes. Advanced serology is sometimes needed to further identify the etiology. For example, when diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is a consideration, aside from bronchoscopy, inflammatory markers in serology become the most useful test. Elevation of the nonspecific inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP is not particularly helpful in this situation. A critically ill patient with sepsis will have equally elevated levels compared to patients with autoimmune diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Thus, we must rely on more specific autoantibodies in combination with complement levels. 
The most common diagnostic considerations include systemic lupus erythematosus, good pasture syndrome, immunoglobulin A vasculitis, or IgA vasculitis, also known as hanak line purpura, and antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies-associated, or ANCA-associated vasculitides. The ANCA-positive diseases are granulomatosis with polyangitis and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. You may have learned these as Wegener's and Church strauss syndromes. Of note, there is a movement away from those nomenclatures. Each is associated with a slightly different pattern of antibodies, and each very slightly in their presentation. However, because there is so much overlap in their presentation, most clinicians will order all of the associated markers as a panel. It is beyond the scope of this lesson to cover the specific patterns for each of the causes for diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Suffice it to say, though, that any elevation or abnormality in these panels should be enough to trigger several things. One, consideration for empiric therapy with high-dose corticosteroids or other immunosuppressants. Two, early consultation with specialists. And three, early transfer of care to intensive care units as these patients are at high risk for rapidly becoming unstable. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.